Uh, I'm Dave Smith from the University of Birmingham, and this is a joint work with my colleague, uh, Myri Gallagher. Okay then, um, so there are two distinguishing features of uh, biological fluid dynamics on microscopic scales. Um, so the first is that inertia is negligible relative to viscosity, and that's because um, the length scales are small, uh, and so there simply isn't, isn't that much massive, massive fluid um, uh, to affect the system. Uh, so viscosity and, and inertia scale differently. Um, and that gives us, for Newtonian flow problems at least, Stokes flow. Um, the other feature is that flow is often driven by complex moving boundaries. Um, so biology generally um, doesn't have uh, nice simple shapes. Uh, so we've got uh, cilia, flagella, uh, curved epithelia, cell walls and so on. Um, and we have to account for that um, uh, when we're uh, trying to simulate a system. Um, the linearity of the Stokes flow equations um, then means that we actually have this opportunity to, um, to, to address that, that second issue uh, by constructing solutions for complex geometries through sums of fundamental solutions. Uh, so those could be discrete sums, integral sums, uh, and those fundamental solutions are well known as Stokeslets or Ocene tensors, depending on uh, exactly which, which community you're from. Um, and these methods underpin um, techniques such as slender body theory, uh, method of fundamental solutions, and the boundary integral method. Uh, these methods have been around, um, well, since the 1950s, and certainly have been enabling um, accurate and, and um, uh, reasonably highly resolved simulations of problems such as swimming sperm since at least the mid-1980s. Um, at the bottom here, we've got some, uh, some examples of uh, so some systems that we work on in Birmingham. So this is uh, human sperm, to kind of contrast enhanced, and you can see the, uh, the shape of the head, mid piece, uh, the tapering flagellum, and then right at the end, uh, the, the end piece of the flagellum. Um, the sperm, of course, swim through the female reproductive tract. Uh, the female reproductive tract is uh, a highly viscous environment where you have um, uh, fluid uh, separating closely opposed surfaces. Uh, you have a very complex internal uh, geometry, the um, endometrium, uh, the internal folded structure of the fallopian tubes and the, and the uh, cervix and, and uh, of course, beating cilia. Um, another example that we, uh, we've studied um, quite intensively with um, collaborators, uh, Susanna Lopez and her group in, in Lisbon is left right symmetry breaking. Um, so uh, this is uh, a, a drawing of a zebrafish embryo at about 12 hours post fertilization. And the initial left right asymmetric events begin in Kupfer's vesicle. Um, in, in mammals, that, that's called the node. And the interior of Kupfer's vesicle is lined with cilia, which produce uh, um, a, a chiral flow. And that chiral flow um, probably transports signaling molecules uh, in order to produce those first left right asymmetric events. Again, if you want to model this and understand what's going on, um, you need to account for that complex moving geometry. Um, so I said this is a computational talk and it's um, very much focused on, on um, uh, striving for computational simplicity. The textbook definition of computational complexity focuses on floating point operations. Um, and, and you could also think about array size as well as something that you can measure measure quantitatively. And of course, these, these matter a lot. So they tell you um, how much you're going to need to spend on, on computers or, or buying core time. Um, of course, these costs do decrease over time through um, Moore's law, which means that the number of transistors on a, on a device uh, roughly doubles every 18 months. Um, although, of course, exploiting the, those advantages is becoming um, more and more um, challenging. And that's something I'll touch on towards the end of the talk. Of course, another aspect of complexity is, is kind of um, the complexity of the algorithms themselves and their implementation. Um, of course, if you want to if you want to do research, then you either you personally need to spend time on it, or you need to uh, train people working with you to spend time on it. Um, and there are obvious financial costs to that, but perhaps um, more importantly, there are um, opportunity costs because the time that you spend implementing an algorithm. Uh, might be time that you would actually prefer to spend uh, addressing new scientific questions or communicating the results. Um, 
so what that motivates is developing methods which are um, both good enough in a, a computational complexity sense, but also simple enough um, in the sense that they're, um, they're not going to take enormous amounts of, um, of, of um, human time in order to, uh, to actually implement and, um, and, um, and uh, get results out from. Um, so, so that's that's the kind of ethos of this talk, which is the art of course stokes. Um, so, doing things that maybe, in a sense, are uh, are coarse because they're um, they're about doing things in a way that's simple to implement, but that nevertheless gives you um, real real advantages in, in terms of computational complexity. Uh, so, the, the starting point is um, this work by Ricardo Cortez at. Uh, um, Tulane University and, and uh, his collaborators uh, in the early 2000s on the, the method of regularized Stokes lists. So the Stokes list is the solution to the Stokes flow equations with uh, a singular point force. So the force driven by a delta function. Um, that solution is well known, I won't recap it here. Um, a disadvantage with that method, of course, is that um, it involves a singularity. That singularity makes integration complex. It, um, it means that uh, if you're computing flow fields, uh, you need to need to take that into account. Um, and Cortez's insight was that, well, obviously you can regularize something that's singular, but um, he, his idea was if you regularize the um, delta function itself, then what you can do is find an exact solution to the Stokes flow equations that exactly satisfies um, uh, mass conservation, so you exactly get div u is zero. Um, the the form of that that um, is in is in, uh, is in that group's uh, two thousand and five paper and that has been most widely used in in the literature is this particular form here, uh, this this um, this rational function, um, and what what that does is it turns this uh, one over r dependence of the Stokes list into a regularized one over r squared. Uh, or one over square root r squared plus epsilon squared type function. So we get something that's large but finite at the, uh, at the point r equals zero. Um, so the form of the regularized Stokes that corresponding to this delta function uh, is uh, this tensor here. So i is the, um, the, um, the flow component, uh, j is the force direction, uh, little x here is the field point, so that's where you're sitting at in the fluid, and big X is the force point. So that's where the force is acting. And then we've got this R epsilon squared, which is R squared plus epsilon squared. So that's the regularization. And then through this choice of the blob, blob function, um, we just get this very small correction here, this two epsilon squared, um, that makes it very slightly different from the standard form for the Stokes list. And of course, as epsilon goes to zero, you approach the, uh, the classical Stokes list. So that's, that's the regularized Stokes slip method. Um, it's an exact solution to the regular to the smooth Stokes flow equations. And from that, you can derive a boundary integral equation that is order epsilon accurate on the body surface. And so roughly speaking, that means that you're, um, without looking at the discretization error or the quadrature error, your your um, solution to the resistance problem in Stokes flow or the swimming problem is going to be order epsilon accurate. Um, perhaps the, the best aspect of, of um, the regularized Stokes lip method and, and the reason that it's been um, quite widely adopted is that it lends itself to an extremely simple uh, numerical implementation. Um, and this is, um, I'm gonna, well, uh, refer to it as the, the Nystrom discretization because um, that's a, a technique from um, uh, from theory of uh, integral equations. Um, so suppose that you're, you're solving the, um, the resistance problem on a rigid body in Stokes flow. Um, so essentially then your, your velocity is equal to an integral of Stokeslets multiplied by forces. Um, and then you can solve this system numerically by, um, by turning that integral uh, into a sum by replacing uh, the, the body surface itself uh, by a set of quadrature points. So quadrature turns your integral into a sum. 
And then uh, suppose that you know your velocity because you're prescribing some rigid body motion. Uh, if you're solving a swimming problem, it's a, it's a slight generalization of this, but if you're, if you're solving a resistance problem, you are just literally prescribing the velocity. Then you construct, um, you construct uh, a matrix of Stokeslets and then you invert that system to find the forces on each Stokeslet and then you can sum those up to get the total force or, or um, sum them up with uh, cross product with position uh, to give you the total moment. So you can solve the, the resistance problem. Um, and in particular, what, what we're doing there is we're, is we're discretizing that surface and then we're choosing our field point X to be each point on the surface in turn. Uh, and that's how we construct our, our integral system. The diagonal entries are the near singular terms. So that's when R is zero uh, and we're just uh, dividing by epsilon. So if the uh, diagonal entries of the matrix are numerically large but finite, that will give you a well-conditioned linear system. So technically this is a, this is a first order Fred Holm integral equation. Um, so, so in general, it's, it's, um, it's actually an ill-posed problem, but the, the numerical largeness of the diagonal entries means that in practice things, things work well, at least from the point of view of conditioning. Um, you, you can Google and find um, many, many papers that have used this, this, this implementation precisely like this uh, to solve all kinds of problems in biological fluid mechanics. So sperm, algae, uh, bacillus, uh, peristaltic flow, um, all, all kinds of different systems. Um, so it's the, the simplicity of the method has led to um, quite widespread adoption. Um, so what I'm going to talk about um, in the, the rest of this talk is um, three particular adaptations to this um, that can give you significantly improved uh, efficiency and expand the range of problems that can be solved. Um, so so um, very old idea of Richardson extrapolation and how that, that can be particularly useful for this system. Um, some work that we've been um, doing and publishing over the last few years in Birmingham on nearest neighbor interpolation. Um, and then I'll briefly talk about some, some work that Myrig's been leading recently on um, GPU acceleration. Um, okay, so first of all, Richardson extrapolation. So the Nystrom implementation has, um, if you do the error analysis, roughly speaking, the error looks like this. So you have a, a regularization error that comes from the integral equation um, you have, uh, maybe this could be improved a bit, but essentially a, an order H, where H is the spatial discretization length order uh, error for the traction. Um, uh, that's the force per unit area that you're trying to find. And then there's this quite awkward term associated with the, the quadrature, so your approximation to the Stokesless integrals, that's order epsilon to the minus one H squared. So what that means essentially is as you reduce your epsilon, your regularized kernel gets pointier and it gets harder to integrate. Um, so the, the quadrature error and the regularization error have opposite dependencies on, on epsilon. So you, because of this, you want to make epsilon small, but because of this, you really don't want it to be too small. Um, worse still, as you, as you reduce epsilon, um, so your discretization size for the quadrature gets smaller. That actually means that your linear system size is going to get bigger because your linear system size is based on the, um, the quadrature spacing. And linear systems, well, your storage cost alone is going to be the square of the number of points. Um, and the cost of solving the linear system is going to go like the cube of the number of points. And remember, this is a, a dense linear algebra problem. So it's, um, it's expensive. Um, so that then led us to think, well, if we, could, if we could push the regularization error to higher order in epsilon, then we could get away with a larger epsilon. And if we get away with a larger epsilon, then we could actually get away with H being bigger. And that could make the, the linear system size smaller, which would be hugely advantageous. Um, and so we went back to this, this old idea of um, Richardson extrapolation, uh, which is 
uh, essentially based on well, you can um, you can if you're trying to calculate some quantity m that depends on your um, regularization error, and you have some understanding of what the um, how that um, the error of that calculation is re related to epsilon, um, then you can you can do a Taylor expansion. So your um, m of epsilon is equal to m when epsilon is zero. So that's what we really want. Um, plus uh, it's, it's derivative times uh, epsilon and then second derivative divided by two times epsilon squared uh, plus um, the, uh, the uh, cube, cube of, uh, plus the cube of epsilon. Um, of course, we don't want to calculate the m0 directly because um, that's, that's going to be, um, that's going to be problematic. We want, we want to calculate m with a non-zero epsilon. Um, so what we can do then is calculate um, two or, or, or three values of m epsilon with relatively large um, epsilons, and that can then give us an order epsilon cubed accurate approximation to m0. Um, and each of those calculations, although we have to do several, each requires relatively few degrees of freedom because our larger epsilon means smaller system size. So, so here, here are some results to start off with, with um, just the original Nystrom method. Um, so with the original method, with um, say epsilon equals 0.1, that's the solid line. So what you see here is, um, first of all, the area is all around um, kind of a sort of single digit to, to double digit. So a sort of order of magnitude around 10%. Um, as you increase the number of degrees of freedom, so as you make things more refined, you, you first of all get this, this improvement in the, the quadrature error, and you generally get this sort of dip, so you get a, a bit of a sweet spot. Um, and then you plateau. So the here the quadrature error has gone away, but then we're plateauing to um, a regularization error that is um, quite significant. So you might get lucky and you might get this, but really you can't expect better than about 10% error. But of course, that's with, that's with a fairly large value of epsilon. If you reduce epsilon further, well, this, the, this is probably about the best curve here with the dashed line. So that's epsilon equals 0 0.05. Um, so things start out worse. The quadrature area is worse to start off with, but that kind of um, comes down actually well below 1%. Um, now, for a real problem, <laughs> you won't really necessarily know whether you've hit this or not. Um, you might get lucky, you might not. Um, for this problem, of course, we know what the solution is, so we, we know that, that we've, we've done well here. But then as you, as you maybe try to refine further to, to actually test whether you've got an accurate result, then you come back again and you start converging to this, um, the, this kind of um, regularization error of a few percent. Uh, dotted line, it's similar behavior again, actually for the, for the number of degrees of freedom that we've calculated, what you find is that um, you, you never actually turn the corner. So past this point, you, you know, it's taking uh, quite a significant amount of time to compute the results. Um, so we didn't, we didn't press on any further. So we start with big quadrature error, huge quadrature error in fact, and we managed to whittle that down, but it's really getting quite expensive. Um, and then last of all, epsilon equals 0 0.01. Again, worse quadrature error, and it's, it's converging, but, but it's slow. Um, um, I've, I've drawn this line on here of 1% error as a, as a kind of indicator of you know, what, what you might think of as an acceptable, acceptably accurate answer. And wall times of 100 seconds or more for solving a, um, a, a rigid sphere um, resistance problem that's 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 quite a long time so consistent results better than one percent error are really, really expensive with um, with the sort of standard implementation um, so if we use richardson extrapolation so the idea um, i just talked about um, so if, if we just do linear extrapolation to start off with we get this red line um, so we're using two reasonably large values 0 0.15 and 0 0.2 uh, and what we get is, well, we, we kind of don't get this sort of lucky dip here, but we do get, um, we do get a progressive improvement and convergence to actually quite a small regularization error. So we're now about 2% regularization error, 
despite the fact that epsilon is 0.15 and 0.2. So it's it's quite forgiving on the quadrature. It's you know the quadrature error is comparable to um, to this curve here with uh, 0.05. Um, and then we converge to a smaller regularization error. So, so that's not bad. Um, if we do quadratic extrapolation, um, well, so, so we're using values of 0 0.1, 0 0.15 and 0 0.2. Um, things actually really don't start out well. Um, but what we're able to do is as we get to kind of um, wall time 10 to 100 seconds, we're able to reduce the, um, the, the percentage error associated with the, the regularization error, very small indeed, so consistently below 1%. Uh, and to achieve this, all we've done is we've run the code three times, and then we've, we've just inverted a three by three matrix. Okay, so that's, that's Richardson extrapolation applied to the original method. So we get some, we get some benefits from doing that, provided that we've got, um, a more uh, a more refined system, so it can give you highly accurate results um, if if that's what you need. So another method that we've been working on um, in Birmingham for the last few years is is based on um, nearest neighbour interpolation. Um, so I've got um, I've got three images here. So on, on the left we've got um, a kind of schematic of the. Uh, the Nystrom interpolation, uh, or sorry, the Nystrom implementation. And I've plotted um, the, the one over R epsilon. Um, so this is, this is kind of the, um, th this gives you the shape of the, the kernel that we're trying to integrate. And you can see that um, for epsilon equals 0.1, it's obviously quite, quite sharply peaked. And so that means that we need lots of quadrature points to have uh, any hope of uh, accurately capturing that. Um, and so um, that, that's why, as we reduce epsilon, we need a very large system in order to get an accurate result. Um, now, a, a, an approach, if you're, if you're kind of um, a, more of a numerical specialist, um, you, you might at this point be wondering about boundary integral methods and boundary element methods. Um, so, so something that, that you can do, and that, for instance, um, Rudy Schweck has, has done with a lot of success and, and we've, we've used to some extent as well, is um, a regularized stokes lip boundary element method hybrid. So um, what you're doing there is you're, you're breaking your surface up into elements. So an element is a patch of surface and then you discretize your um, unknown force, your, your traction based on those patches. So um, you might go for piecewise constant, piecewise linear, piecewise quadratic uh, on each of those elements. Um, and those, those elements probably don't have a huge number um, compared to the, the quadrature points that you have with Nystrom. Um, and then within each element, the quadrature that you do can be as refined as it needs to be. So you could do an adaptive quadrature here. But crucially, you can be very fine with the quadrature without making your linear system larger. So your number of degrees of freedom isn't closely related, isn't, isn't tied to, um, uh, to, your, to your regularization or your quadrature. The disadvantage with this is it's a mesh method. You need to make a mesh, you need to code something up that um, is doing those integrals on, on mesh elements. So that led us to um, an alternative approach, which is kind of trying to get the ease of implementation of the Nystrom method in that it's, it's essentially meshless, um, but with um, most of the efficiency of the boundary element method. And the idea there is to have, um, so we only need a coarse discretization of, of the force or, or traction. So we have coarse force discretization, and that's shown by these, these black points, because um, that's something that's going to be quite slowly varying. And then we have a fine quadrature discretization to capture the, uh, the, the pointy stokesless. Now that fine quadrature is, is going to have to take into account how, um, how small epsilon is, um, but it's not going to affect the size of the linear system. So epsilon and the linear system size are no longer tied to each other. Um, and then, then what we do is we, we deal with the um, working out what the, um, what the traction is at each quadrature point using nearest neighbor interpolation. So we have, have a 
projection from the fine grid to the coarse grid. Um, and that means that we can, we can essentially de-refine the um, force points and get a result that um, generally is at least as accurate, or usually actually is more accurate um, for technical reasons about how, how the quadrature works. So this table here, um, the rows are the number of force points and the columns are the number of quadrature points. And then uh, this blue result here. So this is, this is an um, absolute error. Sorry, this is relative error um, for the problem of a rotating unit sphere, find, finding the moment on it. And the blue, blue result here is where we have the same force and quadrature discretizations. So it's essentially the original Nystrom discretization and we get 5% error. Now, if we de-refine the force points, then we get a 2% error. And that's the general pattern that we see. Things are at least as good when you de-refine. And unless your nice strong result was, was kind of a, a lucky one, and that does occasionally happen, you, you get at least as close. Um, and so as a rule of thumb, actually taking your force points about twice as, um, uh, twice as coarse as your uh, quadrature points, um, you get results that are at least as accurate, but are much faster. Um, so the result in black took about six seconds on my laptop, the result in blue about 350 seconds. Um, so we've, we've published some um, description of this, some error analysis and some applications in a few of these papers, uh, so where you can learn more. Uh, there's also uh, some code available. Um, so in particular, uh, Myra Gallagher's GitLab uh, page has an implementation here, and that's being uh, updated from time to time. Um, and we've, we've applied this to various systems. So you can, you can download these examples, give them a try, adapt them. So this is uh, a biflagellate al algae. Uh, there, here we've got a group of sperm swimming between parallel plates. Um, but essentially, if there's a swimming cell you're interested in modeling, please get in touch with us and we'd be, we'd be happy to talk. So in a, a bit more detail, this, this de-refinement process. So um, here, again, we're, we're looking at this problem of a, of a rotating sphere and working out the moment. Um, so in blue, these are the, nice, this, these are the results with the Nystrom method. Um, uh, so var various values of epsilon. So epsilon equals 0.1 here, uh, down to epsilon equals 0.01, which is, I think, this one here. Uh, this, I think, was the deep that managed to do reasonably well, but um, so, so some do better than others, uh, essentially. As we de-refine, so the, these results down here, our nearest neighbor method, we generally don't lose accuracy. Um, so there's a little, little bit of zigzagging, but we, we stay around the same kind of order of magnitude of error. But we get our results, instead of waiting 100 seconds, we get our results in 10 seconds, one second, maybe even less than one second, uh, because we're able to use uh, a coarser force discretization. So all of these have the same quadrature discretization, but we're making the force discretization more and more coarse. Um, so 100 seconds or one second, does, does that really matter? You, you know, you, it's still, still the time it takes to make a cup of coffee. Well, um, what this means is that as you try to solve more challenging problems, maybe that involve time stepping or much more complex systems, you, you significantly expand the range of things that you can solve. Okay, so that's, that's the nearest neighbor method compared to, to Nystrom. Um, now, if we, if we combine that with Richardson extrapolation, uh, so what, what do we get? Well, with linear Richardson extrapolation, um, we start off here, so this is the um, this is the Nystrom interpola uh, interpolation method. So this takes a little bit longer because we have to run things twice. Um, what we find is some quite consistent results, um, and then we we start to drift a little bit as we go to a, a coarser discretization. And this is our force discretization error starting to become significant, um, but it really really kind of smooths smooth things out, makes things much more much more predictable. And if we use uh, the quadratic Richardson extrapolation, which was we found before was, was more successful, 
So again, slightly more expensive because we've got to run the code three times now, but we get this very nice window here um, between a few seconds to a few hundred seconds, depending on how fine you make, make the discretization. Um, uh, but we're, we're below 0.1% error. So this is combining Richardson extrapolation with nearest neighbor interpolation, and we get really high accuracy and um, potentially really quite cheap results as well. So we're, we're kind of, we're coarsening the force discretization, we're coarsening our epsilon, and we're getting um, actually more accurate results. Um, last thing I'm going to talk about is um, GPU implementation. Um, so all of this code is written in terms of um, basic linear algebra operations uh, in MATLAB. Um, and the advantage of that is that it means you can take advantage of whatever's under the hood, either in terms of hardware or, or software. And in fact, um, there's this GPU uh, array um, command in MATLAB that allows you to take advantage of whatever hardware is on your machine. So we can GPU array force points and the quadrature points. Uh, the rest of the code stays the same. Maybe at the end, we need to, to gather the results back using this command. But essentially, two lines of code allows you to take advantage of whatever GPU hardware you have. Um, and we can look at the effect of that. So um, here we've got, well, to start off with um, what we were just talking about. So these are some, um, these are some results computed on the CPU. Um, so here is the standard Nystrom method. Uh, here is um, nearest neighbor method plus um, Richardson extrapolation uh, uh, using the quadratic approach. So this is, this is using just the CPU on, on our workstation. So now if we use those two lines of code and we bring in a GPU, we get these results here um, in bold. So what, what you notice is for, for cheaper simulations, so small, smaller computations, um, you don't actually get a huge advantage. The, the um, overhead involved in transferring things back and forth between the CPU and the GPU um, just swamps things. So um, for instance, with, with the nearest, nearest and Richardson results, um, we've, we've only got a, a very small reduction in wall time uh, for the um, Nystrom, actually, if anything, it's an increase. However, um, for the more expensive computations, so taking um, hundreds of seconds to do, and actually for, for real applications, these are the things that you're, you're probably going to be interested in, um, we're going from a few hundred seconds to tens of seconds. So this is about 400 uh, down to about 40. So we've got generally an order of magnitude improvement um, uh, from two lines of code and, and having a, a workstation with the GPU in it. So again, this is uh, perhaps coarse in the sense that you're, you're not doing anything sophisticated from a, an algorithmic or a software engineering sense of things, um, but you're getting a, a big, big gain, big gain for little effort. Okay, so, so to wrap up now in conclusion, so Richardson extrapolation in the regularization parameter for the regularized Stokeslip method First of all, it's really easy, so you um, don't need to do anything special. It enables you to, to get accurate solutions with a coarser regularization. That reduces the quadrature error, which means that you can use a smaller linear system. And reducing the size of your linear system gives you big improvements in efficiency. Um, and in indicatively for the nearest neighbor method, uh, that means you can move from say 1% to uh, less than 0.1 percent error so you can get through this coarsening the regularization parameter and coarsening the force discretization you can get actually much more refined results um, and then last of all gpu computing for, for this for this particular algorithm is easy to implement and it can give you for larger problems an order of magnitude speed up and we've we've also applied this to things like flow in the uh, organizing structure in the embryo and um, motility of multiple sperm. So, it's, so it, it does work in practice. Um, okay, so, so um, I'll acknowledge uh, Mari Gallagher, who I mentioned a number of times in the talk. So he, he's co-author with this and um, assuming that you can uh, download talks af after, after the um, official session, 
you might like to see his talk on sperm and flagella regulation uh, and the number is here. And then many thanks particularly to, to Rudy Schweck, who um, we've, we've had a lot of discussions with and who, we're, who we uh, collaborate with. Um, I'll thank Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council for, for funding the work. Um, got a slot, slightly silly uh, picture here, but that's, that's, that's where the uh, title of the talk comes from. And thank you very much for listening.